So thanks everybody for being here. This is Design at Large. Uh, we are our first uh, speaker uh, from out of town today. <laughs> so I am really happy to introduce Julie Kins. Uh, Julie is an associate professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. But she's also associated with the Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering and in the, in the Information School. She's also one of the key members of the DOT group, which stands for Design, Use, and Build. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and her uh, research, uh, which is what she's going to talk about today, primarily focuses on understanding the integration of interactive technologies in health and education, and then designing and creating new technologies for people in this setting. So she is an incredible creative <laughs> thinker. She was named MIT Technology Review Innovator under 35 in 2015. Her work at the intersection of health and technology has had an important impact. So we're talking at lunch, and one of my favorite <laughs> projects uh, is called Baby Steps, uh, which uh, is a work that looked at uh, how technology could support parents to be more aware uh, of the important early development, developmental stage of their children. And she told me that these might actually be implemented as part of Washington State Health Services Program very soon, which is huge, huge um, achievement, I think. It's always nice as a researcher to see your work to be actually applied into the real world. So she's active in the HCI, the Ubicon community. She recently chaired the Ubicon conference. She's been one of the subcommittee chairs of the CHI conference for the last few years. And it's really an honor to have you <laughs> Julie's here. So we're glad to have you here and today, you know, please welcome it, Julie to talk about understanding and reducing mm -hmm. the user burden mm -hmm. and applications mm -hmm. for health. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was funny, I was actually going through the list of speakers and I think I had the longest title of anyone that came through here. So <laughs> thanks for getting it right there, Nadir. So thanks for the introduction. So um, I hear this is a class, so I'm actually gonna uh, do a little bit of uh, interactive stuff in the beginning here. So um, I wanna hear from you. Um, how are some ways that you personally or people you know might be burdened by technology in any way? Is there things you can think of in a way that technology has burdened you? And just give some examples. Interrupts conversation. Interrupts conversations, yep. Anything else? Yeah. Using notifications you don't always want. Okay, yep, kind of distracting notifications, yeah. Keeps you up at night. Yep, keeps you up at night. Yep, disturbs your sleep, for sure. What else? It's expensive. Oh. Expensive, yep. <laughs> Sometimes I get separation anxiety. Oh, you get separation. It's almost the opposite of being too distracting. It's like you miss it when you're, you're away from it. Uh, great. So um, we actually did it. We interviewed um, a whole bunch of people uh, asking the same thing um, with a bit more uh, nuanced questions in there. And, and some of the things that we heard include things like, yeah, the value of using this technology doesn't exceed the, the effort they, they have to put into it. Um, or the value is only sort of you know, useful in the beginning and then they lose its value over time. Uh, it's too expensive to either use it or keep replacing it uh, if they keep losing it. Um, they just forget about it or they're tired of thinking about it all the time. Concerns about privacy came up. Um, they're worried about its impact on friends and family. You know, we heard a lot of stories about phones at, the, at, a, at a restaurant and you know, kind of going out um, for, with friends and everyone's on their phone and not talking to each other. Um, or just you, they can't figure out how to use it or you know, they, they heard from a friend that this was this awesome thing but it's gonna, it has a really steep learning curve and they can't figure out how to use it. Um, so those are just some of the examples that we heard. Um, so we're using this as well as a number of other studies that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later um, to, to build what we're calling a model of user burden um, in technology systems. And so our model has uh, six constructs which I'm gonna talk about in, in terms of their definitions and, and um, um, to give some examples from each of those in this case. Um, so starting out, um, the first um, construct that we have is difficulty of use burden. So this is kind of your classic usability issues um, in terms of, of being able to, to figure out how to use it. Um, and so it doesn't fit within the abilities of the user or is difficult to use. So this can include um, usability issues, but also issues of things like accessibility or uh, localization issues if it's not culturally appropriate um, for the users. So. Um, you know, this includes things like you know, um, you know, people who are visually impaired can't use things like health monitors in, in some cases if they're, they're not accessible. Um, or things like with steep learning curves. So you know, Photoshop is notorious. We had people talk about like, oh yeah, I heard Photoshop is a thing to do for photos. Um, they, they downloaded it or paid the, the Adobe subscription fee and, and uh, were completely overwhelmed by it. So they never picked it up. 
the second category is uh, physical burdens. So um, the system actually makes this user physically uncomfortable in some way. Um, so some examples that we heard here are things like you know, fitness trackers. If you know anything about Fitbit, you know, there was a big deal with them. Their, their Fitbit Flex was causing skin irritation issues for people. Um, so they're sort of just the, actually physically painful. Um, but also things like being uncomfortable or heavy. Um, this is actually what, an example of some of the, the original wearable computing. Um, and you know, it's funny because I know some of the people from Georgia Tech who are in this space, and you, know, you never saw women wearing these because it was actually super heavy uh, to, to wear all that, that equipment. Um, and so and they were, it was just kind of big and, and uncomfortable. Um, but other things we also heard in this category were things like, um, I have to be constantly plugged into the wall, so I have to sit and be confined in this, this space where I have to be attached to a, a power outlet. So that was another way of, of being physically burdensome. Um, the third category uh, grouped together and ended up being uh, considered uh, time and social burdens. So we define this as um, you know, it might require a significant amount of time to use that is not well spent um, or disrupts the user's ability to create and sustain social relationships. So that was like the interrupting at dinner um, or um, you know, things like constantly being distracted by things um, on social media. Um, so yes, it distracts from social situations. Um, also things that just had to be used too frequently, so just the, the sheer amount of time, number of times that they had to use it. So <coughs> examples we heard were things like um, fitness or a diet tracking app where you have to enter every single little thing um, and it takes about eight steps to enter that you had a couple of M&Ms uh, uh, you know, from the candy bowl. So they, you, and they didn't like that they had to do that many times throughout the day. Um, or things like annoys others. So we heard about things like, you know, oh, I hate the, the technologies that spam my, my, my friends on social media, or uh, you know, like the, the classic RunKeeper, you know, auto-generated. I ran 2.27 miles uh, with RunKeeper because you know, it automatically generated it and people started to ignore those. Uh, the fourth category was uh, mental and emotional burdens. So this is things like um, you're requiring significant attention or concentration or being distracting, um, but also things that might make the user feel bad or make them unnecessarily worry. Um, so the, the classic example here would be things like um, this is the, the Wii Fit, um, which is a, a fitness game. And had a little scale that you stepped on and you would step on it and it would make your your me character if you were overweight or obese it actually like expand the character and say in this really nasally voice you're obese uh, and there's you know these stories of these parents of young children being told they're obese and they're <coughs> bursting into tears um, so probably not the best way of conveying it's you good to know this information but definitely not the best way of conveying that um, this is one of my personal examples so if anyone's ever used the delta app um, on their phone um, I was flying from Seattle to uh, Atlanta, and you know my phone's off for five hours or however long it takes. And I pull it out, pull up the phone, looking to see where my gate is, and I get this big red warning that says my flight was delayed. Um, and the big red button says find alternative flights. Um, turns out my flight was one minute late. <laughs> uh, I arrived one minute late, and it puts this big red warning about finding alternative flights. So I panicked. So it makes the user unnecessarily worry. Um, other things like just requiring too much concentration. So people kind of mentioned kind of complex displays um, or things that were you know just you know, they 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 didn't they wanted to they didn't sit in the mood to want to sit and concentrate and focus a lot of their attention on it. Um, the next one was privacy burdens. So this being defined as you know, the system res risks revealing information about a user that he or she would prefer not to share. Um, so it can include things like confusing privacy settings. I think Facebook is notorious for this, um, especially because they keep changing all the time. Um, so people um, have a hard time kind of going in and making sure their privacy settings are just how they want it. Um, but then also things like data capture without transparency. So things like, you know, people are concerned about things like Amazon Echo, which is the, the voice input kind of home automation thing that can, will listen to whatever you say. And it's convenient because you can just say, Alexa, turn on the lights. Um, but then it constantly has to be listening to everything you say um, in order to activate. So people worry about what Amazon is getting from you. Um, and then the last category was financial burden. So these are pretty straightforward. So either it costs a significant amount of money to initially purchase, such as like a hard, you know, like an iPad or something like that, or um, to maintain use. So things with subscription fees and, and things like that, or just things that um, have to be replaced. So you know, many people when Google Glass came out said I would never pay that much for that device. Um, it was you know, I think twelve hundred dollars when it first came out. Um, so that's one of those, the, the significant cost of that was much lower than the value that people um, anticipated. Um, and then it might be expensive to maintain, so every time you break your phone it costs $200 to fix the screen. Um, so that was a complaint that we heard. Um, and this is something that's relative to people, so it's defined how they find it. So you could sort of say that, you know, uh, uh, so someone might find 
buying a MacBook Air to be really um, uh, burdensome. It's much more expensive than a, a Windows machine. Um, and so for them, it's a big burden. Um, but obviously, your income level is going to play into that. But then also the amount of value you get into that plays with that as well. So some people think it's worth it to spend you know, $1,300 on a, a high-end laptop, whereas for other people, it's not. So it's, it's definitely relevant to the user. And all of these were actually from the perspective of what, what, what someone else found burdensome. So what one person finds burdensome may not be the same as what another person finds burdensome. Um, so this was developed um, as we were trying to build a scale for this. So a lot of what we've been trying to do with our work was to figure out, um, you know, we, were, we had this kind of idea of user burden that we were trying to figure out, um, and we were trying to build these systems to reduce it as much as possible, but we had no way of proving that what we built was actually less burdensome um, than you know, the, the existing state of the art. So we wanted to develop a way of measuring it. So um, we ended up developing um, a validated 20 item scale um, with six subscales uh, correlating to each of those six constructs that I put together um, that will, um, that are, um, it's evaluating either currently used systems or systems they formerly used. Um, so the questions are things like, so in the emotional and mental category, using X, so we pipe in the name of the system. So using PowerPoint made me feel like a bad person. And then they could you know, say never, a little bit, sometimes, very often, or all the time. Um, I use X more often than I should. I use Reddit more often than I should. Uh, never, a little bit, you know, um, those things. Um, um, Facebook's policies about privacy are not trustworthy, not at all, a little bit, somewhat. Um, and then difficulty of use included questions like, I need assistance from another person to use um, um, this uh, laptop. So these are the, and there's 20 of these types of questions in each of these categories. Uh, so we validated the scale with uh, over 1,000 people um, and iterated on the scale at least 10 times um, to, to work out through these. We started with a bank of, I think, 200 different questions that had been generated from all the interviews that we had done, as well as uh, relevant literature, um, some uh, similar scales that we'd seen um, that related to the different constructs that we had. Um, we did uh, construct validity with the principal components analysis. So the reason you see things like time and social together, as well as um, the mental and emotional, is we actually started out with eight constructs that ended up being narrowed down to six um, through a PCA. Uh, we did inter-item inter 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 re reliability. Um, we did concurrent validity based on technology that was still in use versus technology that was abandoned. So we saw much more higher burden in the technologies that people had abandoned versus those that had been still in use. Um, and we did convergent validity with some similar scales, including the system usability scale, um, which measures um, usability, um, as well as the NASA task load index, which is a, a scale for, for effort involved in, in using something. Um, so this is going to be presented at, at the CHI conference, um, actually in two weeks, I think. So um, we'll be presenting that there. Um, so I mentioned that uh, it had six subscales. So uh, those are related to the this is six constructs that I just defined, um, and they range in um, you know, from two questions per scale to four questions per scale. So if you're building a, a system that you didn't really care about the financial burden, you know, maybe you're designing for some company that, you know, doesn't really care, um, then you don't have to include those questions. Or like physical burden doesn't apply for some things that are maybe only online, so you might re reduce those. Or if you're trying to improve something, you can kind of just use subscales as well as using, it if you want a shorter version of that, to, um, to use the scale. Um, so, just want to kind of show you how this can be used. So, I mentioned that we validated this with over a thousand people. Um, we had them uh, self-identify what technology they had. We asked them to answer the scale um, for a technology they're still using, as well as one that they have abandoned, um, and that they're no. We we kind of define that as just a system that you're no longer using. Um, so people included all sorts of things. Um, we left it open-ended. They self-defined it. Um, but we did obviously see some clusters there. So. Um, here's kind of the results of some of these things that we looked at. Um, so for example, an iPad. Um, so we had, um, in, our, in our sample for our final version of the scale, um, we had 17 people still using it and seven who had abandoned it. And these aren't statistically significant, so this is kind of just a, a visualization to show you these things. But you can see that you know, the, the inner is, is a, a burden of zero, and the, the outer is the highest burden level of four. Um, so this is the average score across all the people who answered it for this particular technology. So, um, and then the blue is people who are using it, and the orange is people who have abandoned that technology. So um, for the case of the iPad, um, the, um, the people who abandoned it found it much more difficult to use than the people who are still using it. Um, and the mental and emotional burden uh, was higher for the people who had abandoned it than the people who are still using it. But both groups kind of found the, the time and social burden to, to be significant in that way. Um, things like PayPal, uh, people who 
were using it all the time, found it to be very little burden whatsoever. Um, people who abandoned it found it difficult to use or had privacy concerns. Um, Fitbit, um, this was actually one that was a little bit surprising. Um, we had, had kind of smaller numbers here, but um, the people who abandoned it found it much more difficult to use than the people who are still using it. Um, I was actually expecting to see we might see more, more of a physical burden for people who had abandoned it, um, but it looks like that burden is only in place while you're using it. So, um, or maybe they had forgotten that it was a, a burden if they were no longer using it. Um, and so you can kind of see the, the differences there. Um, uh, the Kindle was something that came up, so difficult, again, sort of difficulty of use for people who um, abandon it. And then for time and social, that was actually seen as a, um, uh, the biggest burden. And you know, our time and social questions are actually phrased around you know, time that I wouldn't have otherwise spent on it. So it is sort of getting at their, their valued time. So if people spend a lot of time on it, um, you know, they may not value it as much um, if it's a high burden. So the, the questions are around particularly, I spend more than I should on it or um, I don't like that I spend this much time on it. So if they're using a lot of time and they like it, it shouldn't be shown as a burden in this case. Um, Gmail, uh, people who abandoned it uh, found it much more difficult to use than the, the people who were still using it. And uh, <coughs> people in both cases found it to be burden, the privacy to be burden. Um, the abandoned people found it a little more mental and emotionally burdensome. Um, Netflix, um, <laughs> People who were using it definitely still felt like they were spending a lot more time on it than they should, um, but that was definitely the, the biggest burden there. And then Facebook, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who um, maybe abandoned it because of privacy reasons as well as kind of time and social reasons as well. Uh, and then lastly, Skype. Uh, so this is actually our most abandoned technology that people listed surprisingly. Um, uh, and so 65 people said they no longer use Skype anymore, um, and presumably because it was difficult to use. Um, so why do we care about reducing user burden? So technology abandonment is one issue, but a lot of times you can kind of force people to use the technology because they have to. You know, Microsoft Word, for example, didn't come up a lot in abandoned technologies just because people have to use it uh, for work or other reasons. They might switch to other uh, word processing things, but you know, a lot of kind of Productivity software didn't necessarily come up, but you know, we really do want to use this, um, reduce this as much as we can, um, so it can lead to technology abandonment. And this is especially the case for things that are discretionary use. So, you know, things like fitness trackers and um, apps and those sorts of things that people have many choices and don't have to use. Um, obviously, they will have uh, uh, the more you can reduce burden, the better for those. Um, the different types of burdens can limit the type of people who will be able to benefit from the design. So you know, obviously things with high financial burden are going to be problematic for people from uh, lower economic classes um, than you know, things that are more expensive. Um, people who have concerns about privacy may be missing out on some of the benefits. So you know, you're going to limit the type of people who would be willing to adopt the technology. Um, and then just you know, we care about user experience in general. So um, you know, we can, it can lead to an overall negative user experience. So that's the scale and kind of the model. Do people have any questions? I'm happy to take questions on that in particular now if you want, or you can hold it till the end. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, when people did a bank, did you actually ask them why they did? We didn't in, in the validation. The yeah, we did in our interviews. We talked about reasons why, but we don't have it on the kind of the mass scale that we do the quantitative level. So um, for definitely for future work, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at that. But we didn't necessarily ask in the, in the validation survey. But yeah. So I wonder if there's a potential for self-rationalization in the way some people answer these questions. It's like, well, I'm not using it anymore. Well, it's because it was difficult to use. Right. That's sort of a, that sort of a thing. And I wonder if you can detect that or... Um, yeah, I think that's still open. You know, where this scale's pretty new, and you know, we only have the data that we use for our validation process. So, and it was none of the technologies we had personally designed. So, right. I think that there's um, definitely a potential to explore that. I don't think, you know, we didn't ask them how long ago it had been since they used that technology. So they could have stopped using it a week ago versus five years ago. And I think there's going to be some some effect there as well. So, um, right. and the, other, the other question I had was, uh, what if there's sort of a I just want to say an ecological aspect to this that's not really visible. So, for example, abandoning Skype, that just could be because Google Hangouts came mm -hmm. on the yep, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. Now I can't remember to use uh, Skype anymore because yeah. it's different than the Google Hangouts model. And, yep. you know, and, and again, it's sort of Skype didn't get any harder to use yep. or you know, whatever. Certainly, it's just yeah. Or, 
And that's why, yes, yeah, certainly technology abandonment has other issues than just user burden. So user burden is not the only reason that people abandon technology. So you, you're new, you get a new phone every two years, and so you abandon the old one, and that has nothing to do with how burdensome the phone was, other than, right. yeah. Like right. On those charts that you have for sure, yeah, and that's why you take that with a grain of salt, for sure. I mean, and you given also some of the lower numbers, but just kind of just an illustrative example of, of the things you can use. Yeah, but definitely don't go out telling everyone that's like, oh, you know, Skype is way, you know, because that's definitely not a, 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 a yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is the scale that we were developing was was kind of just kind of self-contained. But presumably, if people are using this, they would they would use triangulation and you know also include interviews and open-ended responses and things. So yeah, the scale is just kind of one component of getting this overall picture for that. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend using the scale and the scale alone um, for for getting at that because you do want to know not just what but why <laughs> for sure. Um, so now I'm going to kind of shift and give you sort of a, a high level view of the research in our lab that we've done that sort of led to us thinking about this broader picture of user burden um, and kind of led us down the, the path of developing the scale. So um, we've done a number of, of different formative studies trying to understand um, um, various aspects of designing technologies that led us to, to think about these things. Um, so I'll kind of go through briefly each of those and, and what aspects of user burden surfaced from these studies. So these all took place before we ended up developing the model and the scale. So this is kind of what informed that. Um, so the first one that we were doing is we were trying to design technology, uh, Nadir actually talked about it in the beginning, about helping parents track their kids' developmental progress. And we were hearing a lot of stories of people who were just felt really anxious about that, um, about the idea that they might use a tool and find out that their kid is at risk for autism or sort of de type of developmental delay. Um, so we really wanted to look into this issue of, of how um, technology might, that might potentially convey bad health news can do it in a way while minimizing that emotional burden. Um, so we interviewed doctors and patients on the experience of a diagnosis um, of a chronic condition um, to hear about their information needs as well as reviewing some medical training literature. So the, the type of literature that doctors use to learn about sharing the news with a patient that, I'm sorry, you know, it turns out that your biopsy was positive and it is cancer. You know, how do they do that in a way that you know, minimizes the, the, um, the emotional pain associated with that but does it in a way that's empathic? So that's kind of, we call it this empathic interface design. Um, so we use that data to kind of look at uh, how we can design technology to minimize um, um, that particular thing. But you know, the thing that we heard about was like, oh, don't tell me the news. I was like, that's not the case. We want to give this news to you regardless, so there's no hiding of information. But can we convey that information in a way that is um, um, going to you're going to be in a way that you can process it? But um, one of the, some of the things that we found are um, you know, delivering any news of, of uh, kind of potential bad health news with an immediately actionable thing that they can do. Um, the worst thing is that you know, we're hearing stories about people who got a phone call from the oncologist at um, uh, 5 o'clock on a Friday and left a message on their phone saying, you know, your, your test came back abnormal call us back on Monday, and they stewed all weekend long and had nothing to do. So you know, that's a bad situation. So if you do give any sort of uh, indication of, of some bad news, give them something immediately actionable that they can do right away. Even if it's just reading about more about it, um, that can be one way of doing that. Um, but then also just acknowledging their fears. That was what we heard a lot from, from doctors in the literature, was just acknowledging patients that, oh, it's okay to be upset, or it's okay to, that you might be anxious about this. Um, that's completely normal. Um, so that was the, the kind of the study there. Um, I've done a lot of work in the, the sleep technology space, um, and so some, a lot of issues came up when we were um, mapping out a design space for sleep technologies. Um, so this was kind of just looking at the, the space that, that technology can play in improving healthy sleep. And um, we did a literature review, contextual inquiry, in a sleep lab and with sleep clinicians. Uh, we did surveys and interviews with, with both sleep experts and potential users, as well as people who didn't want to have anything to do with sleep. Uh, and, no and nothing to do with technology and sleep. They're very anti-technology to hear from them as well. Um, so in relation to user burden, what we were finding was that people hated the idea of any technology in the bed. <laughs> uh, like they didn't like wearing things to bed. Um, they didn't necessarily like um, you know, putting things on their body while they were sleeping. Um, and also people uh, who had tried some sleep trackers felt like there was like this, like someone was watching them <laughs> when they were sleeping. And they were kind of felt this like nagging, and it actually prevented them from sleeping when they, they tried some of these things. 
Uh, we also heard things like, you know, when I'm about to go to bed at night or waking up in the morning, you know, I'm usually so exhausted that I just want to go to bed. I don't want to sit here and fill out some form right before I go to bed. And then likewise, right when I get up in the morning, I'm groggy. The first thing I want is, you know, my coffee. So I don't want to sit there and sort of, what was my sleep quality and, and log all those things. Um, so, you know, they didn't want to have to remember to do that um, because morning and evenings are definitely not the, the best time to ask people things. Um, and then you know, the, they just didn't want to have any sort of um, time intensity involved. Um, a third study we did was um, looking at people who do this sort of extreme data cl uh, collection. So we looked at the people who consider themselves to be quantified selfers. Um, so these are the people who are um, involved in that quantified self community. So people who are tracking things and, and doing statistical analyses and things on their, their own data about themselves. Um, and so we were interested in this community because these are people who are highly motivated, who are doing these things that are very high, bur highly burdensome in general. Um, and so we were trying to figure out what was sort of worth it to them and, and what problems and, and issues that they had. So our data set was doing a content analysis of 52 videos that had been posted on the, the Quantified Self blog over the, the past three years. Um, and the, the Quantified Self has, a, has these meetups that they meet in person and people present on their own data and they answer three questions. So what did I do, how did I do it, and what did I learn? So that was able, they were able to structure our analysis based on, on those three questions that every talk answers, which is great. Um, and so some of the findings that we found is that you know, even the people who are highly motivated um, and you know we're good at this uh, still fell into this issue that they try to track too much information too soon, um, especially because they were highly motivated in the beginning, and then they lost this motivation um, after about a week because they just burned out, um, and so they 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 tracked everything and. Uh, possible in the beginning and then just they quit. So, you know, kind of this, this opposite of a learning curve is the, the kind of excited in the beginning then burning out. Um, the second thing was um, they would collect all this data and then they wouldn't know what to do with it. So a lot of times people have these really specific questions they're trying to answer. So I, I get headaches, what's causing my headaches? Um, or if I sleep better, do I feel better the next day? So they're trying, they had these specific goals in mind, so they would log everything about their sleep or they would log every time they had a headache and they'd end up with these logs of like, okay, um, here's timestamp and headache. So I know, <laughs> great, I have more headaches on Mondays. Well, I don't know why. Is it because it's a work day? Is it because you drink more coffee on Mondays? Is it because of what you did on the weekend? So they had sort of this data, but they didn't have a reason why they were seeing this data. Um, so that was sort of, they, they forgot to log things like contextual factors around their headaches as well. So things like, you know, they didn't log um, what they ate that day or how they slept or what their, um, uh, if they exercised around. They didn't log those other things around it. They only tracked the symptom and not the actual potential triggers. So they didn't track that information. Um, and then sort of this inconclusive data. Uh, the fourth study we've been looking at, and this is kind of getting into the, some of the stuff I've been with his families, is that you know, when we were doing these interviews about what was burdensome, we heard so many stories about like, you know, the, the distracting technology, the, the people, my kid can't put it down, I wish they'd pay attention at dinner, um, or even from uh, you know, parents, uh, um, you know, or their, their parents are using the technology too much and the kid wants their attention. Um, so we were curious, uh, we've done a number of studies in here uh, in this space, but I'm going to talk about one in particular because it's kind of more cross-cutting, but we're interested in the, the types of rules, if people had rules around technology, that they have within households. Um, and this was just recently presented at CCW, but um, we were um, talking, the qu question we were looking at was how our family is currently setting and following rules for both parents and children. So um, what we did was we recruited dyads of parents and children together and did a survey with them. And so the parent would complete the survey, then the child would complete the survey. And so the children were between the ages of eight, uh, 11 and 18. And we asked them, that we asked the parents to report on uh, which rules do they have for their children, which rules do they have for themselves, and then we asked the children, which rules do your parents have for you, and which rules do you have for your, your parents? Uh, so we actually wanted to know if they had rules for their parents as well. And we also asked questions about like how hard a rule was to follow, or um, um, whether or not they felt the rule was fair, um, so those sorts of questions as well. Um, so we definitely were seeing a lot of, you know, parents were using technology uh, that children felt were distracted. You know, they, they, the number one thing from children was that they wanted, the rule that they wanted for their parent was to be present when I'm with you. Um, that was the number one rule by far is the kids wanted their parents to be present. Um, 
there's kind of these issues of privacy as the kids get older. So like for the younger kids, the parents are saying the rule is that I have to have your password for all of your accounts that you make. And you know, when the child was younger, they thought that was fine. But as they start to get older and they want more of their privacy, then that rule wasn't such a great rule anymore. Um, takes time away from families. Um, also, just learn some other things that you know the rules are perceived as more fair if they're set and, and everyone in the family follows them as opposed to just the child has to follow them. Um, as well as if the children have input in these rules, they're much more likely to follow. Um, so those are kind of the studies that sort of inform that. And now I'm going to talk switch over to. Um, uh, the next part of uh, this that um, is talking about the specific designs of the tools we've won and how we've learned about how we can reduce user burden. Um, so for each of these, I'm going to talk specifically about some burdens. So through all of this, we've realized that you know, as we're designing these types of technologies that attempt to re reduce them, there's no way that you can reduce simultaneously all six of those categories. So um, I think it would probably be impossible to design a perfect technology that had zero burden unless it was nothing at all. <laughs> um, so usually there's going to be some trade-offs involved. So usually you have to kind of pick one or two of these burdens and try to maximize for reducing that, but realize that you might increase that burden in another way. So an example of this might be um, if you're trying to design something that's really privacy um, conscious, you might give people some really rich controls over what they can do with their data. Um, but that's going to increase the time it takes for the parent, er, for the, the people to, to go in and manage all that, as well as the mental load of having to remember to do that, go back and check it, um, you'll go back and edit all that data afterwards. So you, know, you might reduce the privacy burden, but then increase these other burdens by doing that. So there's going to be some trade-offs involved. So um, for each of these tools, um, we sort of focused on reducing a couple of, at a time, as opposed to trying to universally reduce them all. Um, so um, I mentioned that we've done quite a bit of work in the, the sleep space. So the first three I'm going to talk about are kind of this progression of how we've gone through sleep um, and how we've designed different tools for that. Um, so the first thing that we realized based on our study that we'd done on the, uh, the sleep technology design space is that we were hearing people like, I don't want to track anything, I don't want to wear anything, um, make it as easy as possible. So we thought, okay, how can we convey important information about sleep and, and try to improve people's sleep without requiring any of that? <laughs> um, so we tried to think of a, a zero effort way of doing that. Um, so what we ended up doing is um, we learned from sleep doctors that there's these time-based things that you can do that can have a positive, negative, or positive or negative impact on your sleep. So these are called sleep hygiene, and they're things like um, uh, don't um, uh, exercise within three hours of bedtime. Uh, if you drink caffeine, do it after about or stop drinking it after about two to three p.m. Um, if you're going to nap, the really the only great time to do it is right after lunch in that siesta time frame. Any other time you do it is going to have a negative impact on your sleep. Um, alcohol, if you have anything within a couple hours of bed, it can have a negative impact on your sleep, which is counterintuitive for people because a lot of people try to have a glass of wine to wind down. And um, it does help you fall asleep initially, but usually after the alcohol oxidizes, you actually get a spike in your, and it wakes you up and then you have trouble going back to sleep. Um, but then also things like starting to relax and get into a bedtime routine before bed can have a positive impact on sleep. Uh, so what we did was we designed just a, a phone-based ambient display um, that would update throughout the day. So we used the, the smart wallpaper feature on Android. Um, and the only thing people had to do is in the beginning they had to set their typical wake up time on weekdays, um, or say they set what a work day was versus a, a home day since people don't always have a, a Monday through Friday schedule. Um, and set their typical wet, uh, sleep wake times and uh, bedtimes on those days. And that was the only configuration they had to do. Then they just had to use it for uh, a set amount of time. And so how it worked was throughout the day, there's basically this sliding timeline. Um, so the white line indicates now, the current time of day. And so these are the different factors I talked about. So caffeine, napping, exercise, meals, um, alcohol, and um, uh, relaxing. And people could also add custom things like medications, or a lot of people added technology use, uh, which now there's some more research showing that that has an impact. Um, but so people track those things. and then. Um, then if it's a thick bar, that means if you do that activity now, it shouldn't have a negative impact on your sleep. Um, if it's a thin bar, if you did that activity now, it would possibly have a negative impact on your sleep. Um, and so you can get a quick glance and say, OK, it's uh, 5.30 or 6.30, and it's too late for coffee. I shouldn't be napping now, but it's still OK to exercise. Meals are still fine, and yay, I can still drink. Uh, so, uh, But it's not quite time to start winding down before bed. So quickly throughout the day while they're checking their other things, and kind of get just this quick snapshot of that. 
Um, so this is no effort whatsoever. They don't have to log anything. Um, and with a four-week pilot study with 12 participants, seven of those were actually able to improve their scores after four weeks of using it. So it's not, um, you know, it's a pretty small sample. So I'm not going to make any big claims, but you know, with absolutely no effort whatsoever, people were able to to improve their their sleep scores on that. Um, a lot of people also were just kind of more aware of what they're doing, and they would specifically ignore these things. So they're like, oh. Too late for coffee, but I really want it anyway. But at least I know what I'm doing, and I know I might have some problems with sleep later. So even though they didn't always follow the, the recommendations, they at least knew what they were doing, and they were a little bit more mindful about it. Um, and then <laughs> we also learned from people that, you know, in our initial, so this is one of those be careful what you ask people, but, you know, in our initial study, people were like, I don't want to log anything, um, but then we did the shut eye study, and people kept saying, oh, it would be cool if I could log my caffeine and, you know, my, my exercise and, and see if it does have an impact on them. So we thought, okay, so logging could have some benefit, but how do we do it in a way um, that will be as low burden as possible? Um, so if we did want data, what's the best way to do it in a way that will minimize um, people's disruptions? So. Um, so we allowed people to um, try to identify what things work for them. Because um, again, in this case, you know, some people can drink caffeine at 10 o'clock at night and have no problem going to sleep, whereas other people, they drink it after 11 a.m. and they're up all night. Um, so people you know, would see these general rules that were based on the population want to know about for them in particular, which is why they wanted to log those things. Um, so um, we wanted to see if we could help allow people to self-monitor these things, but these things are often really hard to track automatically. So it's there's no not that I know of. There's not an automatic caffeine sensor. You might be able to log location and see when you visit Starbucks, but you can't really automatically sense caffeine yet. So these need to be done manually. Um, but for for a lot of sleep stuff, it's not so much the quantities; it's just the when you did it. Um, so we just did a really quick um, lock screen widget that allowed people to do one tap entry. So the idea is they can pull out their phone, and on the lock screen, there's just a widget that they can just do a quick, I had caffeine, um, I had meal, um, I, had, I took medication, or I had a cigarette that also has an impact, or I exercised. Um, and for the study, we had them keep a manual sleep journal, um, even though we, we knew all the problems with it, but that was the best way to do it. But we had them um, record their sleep wake time um, and uh, duration as well as the sleep quality. So we were able to kind of get a sense of that. You could also do a sleep sensor to, to replace that, but for the study we did a manual collection of that. Um, so we um, so once a day they had to fill out a, a one question survey that came up at, I think, um, uh, two hours after their normal bedtime. Um, so they were able to quickly log that and then log the factors. So then we were able to provide these visualizations that showed their sleep over time so they could get a sense of their sleep consistency. Um, and then the, the colors indicate their sleep quality. So yellow is the lowest sleep quality, green is higher, and red is the worst sleep quality. And that's just a subjective score. Um, but then we also provided some ways of, of allowing them to see, OK, I had higher sleep quality on days where I had caffeine before 3. Um, or I had higher sleep quality on days where I didn't have any caffeine after 3, um, or these other sorts of things. Um, so we did a study comparing the, the uh, block screen widget, just a traditional uh, version of it where they go in and enter the data and the, 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 the way they tracked it was identical except that the one had the lock screen widget to enter it and the other one didn't. Um, and how the people who were in that showed um, much better compliance to filling these out and they collected more data in general. It also served as sort of just a reminder to, to log these things so that even just putting it on the lock screen people were able to keep better data. Um, we didn't have the user burden scale at the time. This is one of those studies that we wish that we had it um, to do that comparison. Um, but you know, people self-reported that it was easier to do with this one tap entry. Um, but what we learned is that um, it's really hard to, you know, we were running into some of the same problems the quantified selfers had, right? They were hard to make conclusions from that. They could see that there was sort of this correlation between um, when they, they had caffeine in their sleep quality, but they weren't able to sort of definitively say that. So these types of tools we realized are great for um, what we call hypothesis generation, but not so great at hypothesis testing. So this is a way of sort of helping people identify like, yeah, it seems like caffeine and exercise might have an impact on my sleep and not so much meals or exercise, um, but then we don't know for sure for that. So I'm going to talk a little bit how we're addressing that um, later on. Um, that was behavioral things related to sleep, um, and we also heard a lot of things about environmental things related to sleep. So um, these are things like you know, um, the light levels in your room, the, the sound levels in your room, people, other people, pets, those sorts of things in the room. Um, and those are things that are hard to do because you're asleep. Uh, so um, we wanted to allow people to investigate these uh, particular aspects of, of sleep um, in a way that would allow them to go and explore like you know, what does my sleep quality look like when it's colder or 
um, you know, what's um, interrupting my sleep? Is it sound-based things or is it um, noise? Or sorry, is it noise levels? Is it light levels? Um, so what we did is we built, um, it's a pretty kludgy prototype. There's just a, a graphic over there, but it's a big box with all these sensors on it. Um, now you can actually buy these great, sophisticated, beautiful ones that are like this small. But you know, this was back in 2012 and it was all hacked together with Arduino. But uh, we basically put together this box that had a light sensor, temperature sensor, noise sensor, um, and two motion sensors, one pointed at the bed and one pointed at the door. Um, and also had an infrared video camera that was taking still shots. So people could sort of do this, this full, rich capture of their sleep time and go back and investigate these things. Um, I'll tell you in a second why that was not the great thing. But uh, what we uh, realized is that you know, the bedroom is a pretty private space for many people. Um, and a lot of people do things in the bedroom that they don't want recorded. And people were very frank in our studies about what those things were and described them in detail. And you know, I had very embarrassed uh, uh, graduate students who were learning these things about people that were, they were completely open to sharing. So the idea being, you know, they're they're you know having special time and they don't want that captured. Uh, so we had to think of a way of of capturing this data so they can do these investigations about their sleep with in a pr way that was privacy preserving. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the privacy features of such a system. So there's just really quick access um, on the, the main screen about um, just turning the recording on and off and the ca or just the camera on and off so you could record keep the sensors recording but not the, um, the, the video camera component. Um, there's a really quick delete last hour button so you know, it would just go back and just wipe out the last hour um, or as well as a, a way then go back and kind of fine tune and delete things um, in general. So if they said like, oh yeah, I had a private conversation where I totally bashed my, my, my boss, I probably should go back and delete that. So they go back and, and play, that, play that back. Um, also in the design, we wanted to kind of just do this really quick check. So the, the red and green are, are um, actually an indicator if they're, those levels are within the recommended range. So they could get a quick check and say, um, okay, the temperature level is actually too hot or too cold. So it's red if they get a quick glance. And the light levels are too bright right now, so I should turn off the light. But the noise levels are good and there's no motion happening right there. Um, in our initial prototypes, we also did air quality, but in our initial testing, the, the air quality sensor we were using was actually really noisy because it had a fan and it was disrupting people's sleep. Uh, so we ended up removing that, but um, there's some commercial systems now that, that do air quality, but that was another thing we are gonna do. Um, and so you know, we, people were able to identify things, like they would see, um, I don't have the screen that shows a graph, but they could see these graphs that were correlating things like their, their light levels with their sleep quality. Oh, we had them wear a Fitbit as well um, as a sleep sensor, so we got a sense of their awakening. So they got a visualization they could see when they were awakening and then go back and see, oh, there was like a noise spike there. And then they could go back and play back the video and say, oh, that was where the cat came into the room and started scratching at things. So they could kind of investigate what was disrupting their sleep. Um, by going back and playing the video at that time. And it was like they could quickly just uh, touch the graph and it would bring up the video from that amount of time. Um, but you know, the, the main thing here we were looking at was trying to minimize the, the privacy aspects of doing this rich recording of, of their sleep. Um, this had the same problem of uh, the sleep tight application and that you know, people were you know, finding these interesting things, but they really didn't have this conclusive data. And so it's hard to draw conclusions from it. Um, so that was sort of get leading our thinking um, on how we might do this next, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, the fourth app that we um, I was going to talk about was sort of inspired by a lot of the stuff we've done on families um, and looking at you know, how we can encourage mindful use of smartphones within families. Um, and we heard a lot of stories about things that are just sucking you in and you, you intend to play five minutes of Candy Crush and before you know it, an hour and a half has passed. Um, and so people just would kind of get lost in those things and they would realize that they aren't meeting their goals for those days. So we just built a really, really simple app um, that people can set. Um, goals for how much time they want to spend and what they define as time-wasting apps. Um, so there's a, a screen where they can just go through it. It shows all the apps installed on their phone and they can just select which ones they want to log. So they can say, um, you know, like log Candy Crush and Facebook and Twitter and, you know, the, the Reddit apps and, and monitor my time there. Um, so just as a log and then while they're using the app, um, if they've exceeded their time, um, they just get a little warning. Um, doesn't interrupt their, well, with Candy Crush sometimes it interrupt their game a little bit, but um, I uh, will say like, okay, you've expanded your time. We did have a, a snooze button. So I could say, I need some more time. You know, I'm, I'm okay now. Um, and so we also allowed them to enter a goal um, that at the beginning of the day of something that they wanted to try and do today. So as the time up, time's up came, it just conveyed, um, you know, try this instead. Today I wanted to spend more time outside or read a book. Um, and you know, we did a, a multiple baseline study with this um, where we had people 
logging all their um, app usage, um, and then we introduced the intervention. They were reduced their time wasting apps uh, usage by 21% uh, after we introduced the. Um, the intervention there. So it's a short-term study, but we are finding, finding some promise with this. So this is kind of getting at that reducing the time burden. Um, and that will be presented at, at CHI this year as well. Um, the, this is where we decided to try and um, help the people that we are learning with these, these sleep-based studies that just logging these information doesn't give you the answers that you're looking for. The answers that we were hearing from quantified selfers that they wanted to um, you know, understand what was causing their headaches or understanding the impact that sleep has on their, their life or what caffeine has on their, their, person, uh, on their mood. Um, so we wanted to think about this idea of how we could um, enable these, what we're calling self-experiments. So tools like that are just kind of straight out personal trackers are great for hypothesis generation, but they're not so great for hypothesis testing because you might see these correlations, but you know you might see that you sleep better on days that you get exercise, but you don't know if it's the exercise that's doing it or if you're in a better mood because you exercised or you felt more energetic because you had you know caffeine that day and that encouraged you to exercise. You didn't know what was actually improving that sleep overall. So you know, people would have these ideas of what might be doing it, but they didn't know for sure. Um, and you know, for things like people, I trying to identify things like food triggers um, for things like celiac disease or, or um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome or things like food sensitivities. You know, people are trying to eliminate these things entirely from their diet based on spurious conclusions that they've drawn from these these um, kind of what we call these hypothesis generation apps. Um, and so we want to allow people to. Um, answer these questions in as low of a burden way as possible. So um, you know, we talked to a lot of people who are keeping things like food journals. So they keep this really copiously detailed food journal, really you know, like, you know, detailed you know, on either on paper or on these apps. Um, it took forever to fill out. Um, and they log things like their symptoms with, you know, like if they had an upset stomach or a headache or um, other sorts of aspects of things like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, gas, bloating, or those sorts of things. And so, that, but they still weren't able to make those conclusions. So um, we realized that if we do a, a self-experiment with them, that we can actually come to those conclusions. So um, we're building an app right now that allows people to self-experiment with this, where we actually will randomize which days they change those variables. Um, so right now, the app, you can choose to do four different studies. So things like lactose, um, gluten, um, uh, caffeine and artificial sugars uh, are the kind of four top causes at a population level of what might cause irritable bowel syndrome symptoms. Um, and you can log your, um, basically you're randomly assigned to days to either eat gluten or not eat gluten or drink caffeine or not drink caffeine. Um, and we do it at breakfast, so you change whatever you're doing at breakfast. Um, and then three to four hours later, which is usually when you'll see the symptoms of IBS that are food-based appear, um, you enter in your, um, your symptoms on a scale of one to four. Um, so because we're doing a randomized uh, assignment, we're able to actually generate um, some uh, you know, uh, um, con more causal related conclusions um, with, with some of these things, as well as provide people with some visualizations of, you know, these are the days that I had caffeine and these they were the days that I won't, and you can kind of visually see that on the caffeine days that there's, um, you know, an, an improvement as well as that. Um, and this is really trying to help people understand, like, you know, maybe that's a mild improvement to them, and they really like caffeine, they need it to, to actually get through their day, so it's really not worth cutting it out, because you're only seeing a mild in, uh, improvement in their symptoms. Um, and we're, we're starting with food triggers for IBS, but this approach can actually be applied to the, a lot of the sleep-based things like insomnia uh, or things that are keeping them up at night, um, as well as the impact that sleep might have on their day and these other sorts of questions that people have. Um, we're also looking at things like what, what's triggering um, people like smoking cravings for people who are trying to quit smoking. Oh, yeah, maybe here. How do you find the experimental design of the <laughs> So how do you decide when to do what? So we did, we're working with a, a cognitive psychologist that is pretty um, expert in, in single case study design. So we've done a lot of power analysis to look at, at what um, types of study designs are, are going to give us the most power for the least amount of time. Um, and so um, things that became, can be measured frequently are good um, and completely randomized designs um, are good as opposed to like an A, B study um, where you kind of do it and then stop doing it. Um, so completely randomizing things gives us the most power for the shortest amount of time. Um, and you, you obviously have to be within control of what your trigger is. So things like you can't really do a self-experiment about the weather because uh, you can't say, okay, tomorrow be cloudy and on Wednesday be sunny and you know, you, so you can't randomly assign the weather. 
Um, and they also have to be things that can be numerically measured um, in some way. So those are kind of what we're, we're looking at. But you know, we, we have a paper that um, I cite down here that has a, a good kind of listing of sort of the, the requirements for what makes good domains for doing self-experiment and what makes not good domains. And one of the bad domains is like experimenting with your medication. You probably shouldn't be doing <laughs> like don't do a self-experiment with your your um, you know your prescription medications. Uh, try not to do you know. So we have some you know, things that are safe to experiment with or um, um, things that are within your control or some of those requirements. Kind of is that sort of what you're thinking or? Okay. All right. Um, so lastly. Um, we're, I mentioned at the very beginning that a lot of the stuff worked on because I've been working on this study with parents of young children um, and trying to reduce the burdens, um, emotional burden associated with tracking development in young children. Um, and I've also been working with the state of Washington um, to the, who have the goal of tracking every single child in the state of Washington and, and monitoring their developmental progress. Um, and what we are finding, and it's certainly the, the, the people who are from higher socioeconomic statuses, they get screened and they get identified much earlier than the people who um, you know, are from lower socioeconomic status. So we needed to have um, a way of, of helping them track progress in a way that was financially, um, reduce the financial burdens associated with things, um, as well as access to technology, um, and then convey the information in a way that was reducing the emotional burden. So those are the two that we tried to, to reduce the most in this design. Um, so what we end up doing is, um, you know, this is based on a lot of uh, user research, but we found out that not one single tool will be um, uh, will meet the needs of, of tracking every child. So by coming to them using whatever technology they're using, um, as opposed to expecting them to download our app or use our, our system, we try to meet them to where they were. Um, so we have three different me mechanisms of doing tracking, at least with our prototype, as well as some ideas for about three others. But we have a web version, we have a Twitter-based tool, so parents can actually answer screening, developmental screening questions while they're doing other things on Twitter. Um, directly through Twitter, they don't have to install anything. They actually just follow their child's birth month and get age-appropriate tweets, um, do a direct message back to our system with a, a specific hashtag, and then our software will go through, um, take the response to that, and add it to a database. Um, and then we have a text messaging version for people who don't necessarily have internet access as well, where they can answer the questions directly through text message. Um, and no matter what they, if they use, they can use any of these tools, all of these tools, um, um, they can, they all work independently or they all work um, um, together as a whole. So if they answer a question via text, it shows up on the website as well. Um, so that was kind of on the, the, the access uh, component. But then conveying that information was tricky too. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how to convey that their child might be behind developmentally. And you know, we found that you know, we, we did you know, lots of mock-up visualizations of things like you know, a, a normal distribution and you know, here's where your child is. And you know, showing, telling a parent that their child is 87th percentile, even though their child's fine developmentally, they don't like that very much. Um, so we have, um, you know, we, we also wanted to know that a lot of times people might be lower on development just because they haven't had the opportunity to practice that skill. So you know, we end up using this metaphor of you know, it's just a tree that hasn't grown yet. You know, it just needs more encouragement or needs more water to grow. Um, so we have just a visualization that shows like here's the developmental categories and you know, for the fine motor category you're in this, this lowest category. Um, but here's some activity and so remember the, the study we did that said um, do actionable information. So if they're in these categories, um, if they're in the middle category, they're okay, they're kind of on the bubble, um, but they can, we just encourage them to do development activities. So we link them over to some activities they can do with their child to encourage development in that area. So for example, if they're low on problem solving, you'll hear, you know, hide this ball under the blanket and see if your child can find it. So to practice that skill, so they can immediately practice that if they're lower in that area. Uh, if they're in the lowest category, which is the sec like second percentile or lower, um, we give them a, a, 20, a phone number that's 24 hours that they can call anytime um, to, to uh, get um, an official sort of screen and get connected to early intervention services. So um, if they get that news that their child needs more evaluation, um, then they can immediately do something about it. Um, it's also not shown here, but we have a lot of language about kind of, you know, development is variable. It's normal to feel somewhat anxious about how your kid's doing. So again, that acknowledging the feelings is part of that too. So, um, in conclusion, um, just wanted to kind of sum it all up. So, in sort of this, this reducing user burden aspect, we have some themes that were kind of coming up through a lot of the work that we've done. Um, but some strategies that we found were things like embedding actions into activities people were already doing was a way of reducing burden. So, for example, you know, the integrating the developmental tracking into Twitter or things that people are doing were, were something that was great um, to do. Um, people found it pretty low burden to kind of bother, as they're doing other things, to also answer these questions as well. 
um, providing multiple options for achieving their goals. So different people find different things burdensome. Um, what's burdensome for me is not necessarily burdensome for you. So if you have multiple options for achieving that, um, then that can um, be a good way of reducing burden. Um, prioritizing the ones that are most important to your target users. So again, you can't reduce them all at once. Um, so this is kind of your classic, know your user, um, do user research, you know, figure out what matters to them, and then try to prioritize those burdens more than any of the others. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, figure out what the trade-offs are. So if you reduce one, what does that do to the others? Um, and then also make the burden match the user's motivation level and benefit. So we found that people who are highly motivated were probably to put up with much more levels of user burden. We saw IBS patients who had been keeping like copiously detailed uh, journals for three months straight because they really, really wanted to find the cause of their, their, their symptoms. Um, and so they're really super mo motivated, whereas people who are more casually interested in things, oh, I'm curious about my sleep, they were not willing to put up with much burden at all. So try to find out what the, the motivation level is and match it to there. Um, and then lastly is this, this uh, you know, in this world of big data, um, we realize though through all of this that data is burdensome. You know, uh, it's if you the more data you collect, the more it burdens the users, the more privacy aspects it has, the more you have to deal with it. Um, figure out what that minimum viable data is uh, for accomplishing a specific goal as opposed to this notion of like, let's just collect everything and see what we learn. Um, because that notion of collecting it um, adds a, a bunch of burdens in, in a lot of different ways. So. I'm um, right at five o'clock, so, um, oh, um, oh, I did have a couple next steps, but one of the things I wanted to say is kind of refining the, the models of user burden to ac accommodate things like uh, trade-offs and values and benefits. Um, more validation of the, the user burden scale, it's brand new, so we're learning more about it. Um, and then lastly, the, the burden scale is only good for assessing tools that people have already used. And I'd really, really love to know if there's a way of assessing burden at sort of the early prototype stage before people are using it. So we're looking at ways of can we predict user burden um, earlier in the prototyping stage as opposed to having to build out a system and give it to people to assess it. So thanks to all my awesome students and people who give me money. Thanks. <laughs>